All right. Well, last but not least this week uh, on what we going to do about elections, we are talking to my girl, Teresa Acuna, Associate Director at the Harvard Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. So her job is to think about democracy as this kind of evolving concept with real world kind of impacts and entry points for its citizens. And so she wants to talk to us about how we can get involved, how we can start thinking of this as something that isn't static. Um, and she has some pretty good recommendations for us in terms of how we can prepare for November and for a world of increased civic engagement um, generally. So uh, here's my conversation with Teresa. Center and kind of framing of this conversation. Sure, I'm Teresa Cunha. I'm Associate Director of Democracy Programs at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And, and we are a think tank who produces innovations in governance and public policy through research, education, and public discussion. My day-to-day -day job is bridging academia with practice, incubating ideas that solve challenges to our democracy. And lately, I've been thinking about our country's need to reimagine our democracy. What would you say most people's idea of a democracy is? I think that most people think democracy is just like government. It's not necessarily something that, that like, is that they're a part of. It's more of an idea or it's more of like a bureaucracy, like kind of spin on that. Yeah, democracy is not one thing. It's not a place. Um, it's not tangible. It's not static. Um, it's a shared idea that we all buy into. It's ever evolving about fairness, equality, and transparency, among other things. Um, and it's, our, it's about the ability to buy into our democracy also hinges on, on faith in, in democratic institutions. And that faith um, in some ways is eroding in multiple areas, and, and, and not least of which is, is our elections. And, you know, kind of timely to this discussion and where we are right now is how we should be thinking about voting in midst, um, amidst a, a, a pandemic. And, and this pandemic um, has people questioning why things are done the way they are. Um, they are questioning an economic system that is predicated on income inequality, um, the fact that votes don't carry the weight and access to our election systems is, is sometimes hard for a lot of populations. And we're seeing all of those things play out right now. Uh, you know, I want to have some more questions, but I want to get more into this erosion. I mean, a lot of people think that, for instance, like our current president, he who shall not be named, uh, is kind of like, he's the one eroding it, as opposed to him being an ex like a proof of its erosion. Can you kind of say on that? Yeah, I mean, I guess that, that could be up to interpretation. I mean, Donald Trump... I said his name. No, did not, did not did not create income inequality three and a half years ago. I mean, this, or deportation or any of that. Right. I mean, this shit has been a problem for a long time, and the most vulnerable have been in feeling the brunt of all of this for a very long time. He, in a lot of ways, exasperates a whole host of other issues to our democracy. Um, I mean, you know, he was tweeting the other day about how he just doesn't trust um, um, mail-in and voting. Like- even though, even though it's what our military has been using for decades. I mean, no absentee voting started in the Civil War. I mean, it's been around as long as like, almost we've been around as a country and our military um, brothers and sisters have been using it consistently um, in every election. So, so you know, in some ways, there's like new challenges to our democracy, but the, in terms of inequality and kind of these like fissures of our society as we know them have been persisting for quite some time. And so obviously like most people's participation in our democracy is limited to voting. And so that takes place during elections. And obviously that's the focus of this week. And you know, if it weren't for this pandemic, I'm sure it would have been the entire focus of this year. So kind of getting us back to thinking on that, kind of what are, in your opinion, what's the state of our elections? Kind of how is that system working? Yeah. So I think that this should go without saying, but we should not put anyone in the position to choose between exposing themselves to the pandemic and exercising their right to vote. Um, while all states, right, 
Duh. Yeah, it seems like it um, seems like uh, straightforward, <laughs> but that has to be said. Right, it has to be mentioned. Um, while all states provide a form of vote by mail, it does not mean that they're equipped or prepared to handle a massive number of requests for mailing ballots. And these items need to be procured in advance. For example, Wisconsin, after some really interesting um, back and forth between the governor and its state legislature, and then its state Supreme Court, ultimately the US Supreme Court, um, held a primary election in early April, which is at, what was at the, at the height of um, the COVID spread. And, you know, through weeks before, there was communications that everyone needed to go request a mail-in ballot, um, or that the deadline was going to be extended. Well, can't come election day, people did not receive their ballots, partly because the, their systems, like their offices that actually mail these out, ran out of supplies. Yeah. They didn't have enough personnel. Um, and, then, and then altogether, just the lack of information and education that was being conveyed to voters in real time was really lagging. So this is all wrong. As a result, people schlepped their way to, to um, get in queue to vote and people waited hours to vote. Also- Literally, part- literally like vote or die, <laughs> you know? I mean, or truly, die and vote. Yeah. Die and vote. And I mean, I mean, it, it shouldn't, you know, that kind of decision making doesn't have a place, I feel, in this country. And also what kind of exasperated things and because everything, the decisions to actually go forward with the, with the vote happened so late was that there also wasn't enough poll workers um, mm-hmm. to actually staff the, the um, location. So people waited again for hours. I say that's a form of voter suppression. Some people, because, you know, what about the people who are essential workers and had to report to work and didn't have three hours to spend in line? Right. Um, or the people with chronic illness or maybe even people with perceived just concern. Perhaps these are, these are people who are expecting or have chronic issues. I mean, these are all voters and they all have that right. So it's, um, it's really critical for states like Wisconsin, who um, typically on an average year, only saw about 5% of their voters voting by mail. Um, and that massive swell of, of these new requests um, shocked their system. So mm-hmm. I wanna know if I lived in Wisconsin or if I lived in the state that's not thinking through this, I need to know from my election administrators, governor and secretary of state, what are we doing to make sure that I have access to the ballot box? Um, and imagine, oh, sorry. And imagine that Wisconsin is just one of 50 states plus the territories. I mean, there are, you know, any number of unique scenarios, you know, within and between states. Uh, So I think that this is something that's going to, that's why I'm so concerned. Because it's like, this is all, there's such high stakes that they can't be figuring this out in real time. Right. The states can't, or the voters. Right. And, and I think it's also really um, critical to say that in addition to a robust and timely mail voting mechanism, all states need to make sure that they have their polling locations up and going and push your states to also allow early voting. Um, you know, right. in states like California, you can you have a couple of days before the actual election to go and um all of this and it's, is- and it's also i'll add i did it the day before during my primary here and there was no one there i had to re-register in la i was still getting all the sacramento mailers but up until that day you know god bless um but i was so surprised that more people weren't taking advantage of it and then to hear the next day that the same location the ace hotel there was a two hour wait. I'm like, guys, you could have been doing this for days and days. So I think it's also about kind of shifting people's knowledge and practices. Oh, you can yeah. still get your sticker a day before. Yes, you know? you can. And then you can wear it for two days. Um, no, and, and you know, along those lines, but along those lines, it's, it's also just education, right? You know, Trey, Trey Borden is, I would say, a hyper-informed citizen, knows that he can, yeah, super citizen over here, can, can actually knows that you can show up and vote somewhere. So it's really incumbent on all of us 
um, to make sure that you are providing that education to your to your loved ones about their ability to vote early if possible and also making sure that everyone is registering to vote um, by mail if 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 need be if you that's where your comfort level is and, and that's completely appropriate um, and I just wanted to plug really quick if you wanted to find out more um, about registering to vote or any type of resources for voters and I really encourage everyone that's watching today um, to make sure that they start thinking of what their voter plan is. Yes, six months in advance. I, that's what I, that's where I need everyone right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and because things like, are- what's happening moving, tomorrow? <laughs> exactly. Um, because things are moving very quickly and, and if things are not moving in the direction that ensures full accessibility to voters, you gotta raise hell. You gotta raise mm -hmm. hell um, with everyone in power and make sure that that your friends and family and network are also raising hell. Don't let this happen to you, you know? Right, and uh, you know, just to bring up something that your friend Robbie said, um, I joked with him about his, uh, I was interviewing the beer pong queen, in addition to being a democracy queen, yeah. um, <laughs> that people need to also be really vigilant about what's happening while they're voting. You know, it's like, if you're seeing some bullshit at your polling station, like me in downtown LA, I'm not concerned about intimidation or people who are gonna be there to kind of make sure that I don't practice what I need to. You know, if I'm in Georgia or Alabama or Mississippi or, you know, maybe parts of California for all that, you know, you really need to be, you know, you see, si ves algo, di algo, you know, as they say on the subway, uh, you know, not that anyone's using it right now, probably. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think that voting in elections for sure. What other kind of things that kind of surround our democracy that like are need to have more participation <clears throat> kind of in a civic way? Yeah, so, 2020 was significant for a lot of reasons. One, there's a very consequential presidential election that's happening, ton of down ballot races that are happening, but also um, something that is often overlooked, but it's absolutely necessary to our democracy is the decennial census. Mm. So um, right. right now, 59% of people residing in the US have answered the census. And remember, the census helps determine apportionment through the number of seats each state receives. Um, that translates into political In power. In Congress. In Congress, that translates to political power. Um, and then the data is used to um, redistrict, so draw the lines of where, of who your representative is. Um, and then often overlooked is that it also helps inform the distribution of 1.5 trillion dollars of funding that goes to really vital services such as schools, hospitals, roads, transportation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And an undercount of a, any community is essentially on, um, it's essentially robbing the community of these essential services. And we just can't underestimate the importance of a full and accurate count in the census. Mm -hmm. And we have one shot to get it right. Right. It's erasure, you know, which is bad enough, just kind of not knowing who, who these people are. But it's also like, it's, you're not going to have what you need because you don't exist to us. Um, I don't think people kind of put that into perspective. Um, that's crazy. Do we know kind of typically what the undercount is? Um, what the typical, I don't know off the top of my head. But I would say, like, whatever the number, it's too high. Because, yeah, any amount. Right, because... And it's always in the type of people who are undercounted probably yeah. are the same. Yeah. yeah. So it's the hard important. to count populations are the people that often need the most services in our, in our society. Um, these could be people who don't have a home. I mean, we're, we just are confront, confronting an incredible um, strain on our economy it could be very feasible that people are losing their homes or where they're living, or maybe they have to move, um, in, move in with friends and family. And so the way that the census, um, the first couple of mailings was that they, they sent you basically a reminder to an address. But what happens when you don't have an address? Right. Um, the census has census takers that actually um, go, I mean, on foot, basically in, in spots where they know that people reside in non-traditional housing and count them. But we're in the middle of a pandemic and exactly. we have this socially distance. And so this is all the shit that it's like, it's scary because again, 
I, you know, I want to think that I want my federal fund, my taxpayer money to go to the area of my community that can provide these um, needed services to people who don't have homes. But what happens when we can't prove that these people live in my community? Um, so that's what happens when we don't have an accurate count. Um, and so, you know, for those that, again, are listening and haven't taken the census, uh, please do so. Take it. Yeah, take it. Um, make sure that your uh, friends and family are taking it. Make sure that they're counting every single person. I know it's true in, in my family, we have um, a lot of multi-generational um, family members. And so mm -hmm. make sure you include the baby. Um, make sure you include grandma. It's not just your nuclear family. It's everyone who lives under your roof. Uh, make sure that they're counted. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, like to hear you say that, like we have the census, we have this presidential election, we have this pandemic. It's like 2020 is relentless. I mean, this is truly the perfect storm. Like of all the times for this to happen, it seems like it happened at like the absolute worst time. But maybe that's also like what's gonna make people really wake up and realize the true risks that we have with a system that is brittle and kind of not functioning well. Um, anything else kind of, I know that we have uh, oh, like, you know, you talk about mail-in ballots, we have our beleaguered ass postal service recently. I mean, you talked about poll workers, kind of like, what are some other elements of this? Yeah, so let's delve in a little bit more. Um, because, you know, 2020 um, is relentless and can't stop coming for us. Um, <laughs> yes. it's, it's also coming for our beloved U.S. Postal Service. Um, you know, as a person who I might be one of the few people who still believe in stale mail. Um, like Good for you. I, me and Robbie, I didn't know. It turned out I didn't know what a stamp costs the last interview. Oh, it's like 50 cents now. It's like 51 cents. I was like, it's not even two a dollar. Dang. Anyways. I know. <laughs> Um, but you're not alone. Most people, I would say, like the millennial generation and down. Um, I mean, everything's electronic. So why would we know that? And plus, buy a forever stamp. Like, right. <laughs> that, right. that's my solution. Um, but no, so, so there's some, and this is also should be of all of our concerns. So, so we're in the middle of a pandemic. We have very essential um, electoral work that needs to happen, like voting. And we're asking states to provide robust ways for us to vote via mail. Well, we need someone that we really trust to be able to get us the, the ballots and for us to get the ballots to our, our um, election officials. And so we have turned to the U.S. Postal Service in, the, in, in, in years prior, and they've done yeah. a pretty good job. Um, again, there's a lot of, um, I feel like, alarmist around, like, how dependable are we with the U.S. Postal Service? Very negligible, like, Give me a break. You know, indications of like what fraud or whatever would be. Like, it's a trusted way to vote. I mean, uh, these fools jump over dogs every day, you right. know, to get you your mail. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they're like the most dedicated public servants we got out there. And right. the problem is, is that it's, it's um, running up some real financial issues. And so... Um, it said that the funding will run out before the election. And so we basically need to be putting the pressure on Congress. I mean, we need a bailout. We need- And then the most popular bureaucratic government agency, which I didn't know, but I'm not surprised to learn. So it's like- I mean, I'm saying like, right, in a time where there's like, it's the lowest amount of trust in our government, but here's this one entity of service that they provide that we, that we see is at play and we're especially as we're sheltering in place, we've come to really depend on. And now we're encountering a situation that for like one second, our public officials are blinking their eyes at the fact that they need to help them like is beyond me. So like put like turn up the heat on your elected officials. Like we need a plan in place. Don't wait until it gets too, you know, too late into the summer. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have Jeff Bezos delivering our votes. We want that. Y'all want that? Right. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't want that. I don't want that. Absolutely not. Um, what else? Let's um, let me talk a little bit more about about poll workers and, and what we um, okay. mean about that. So most of you have gone into your polling um, location and you're greeted by the warm smiles of your um, community members, and you know most likely these are. Um, 
of the retirement age, um, sure. something like in 2016, over 50% of poll workers were over the age of 60. It's a librarian demo for sure. For Nothing sure. against our millennial librarians, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> And, um, and so, you know, even for the states that, that held a primary in the middle of pandemic, started noticing, wow, well, all my poll worker volunteers are not showing up, or they've let me know that they're not going to show up pretty reasonable. Um, wouldn't you say, I mean, I mean, there's a, there's a pandemic, um, and we should probably be doing everything we need to do to avoid a situation where people of vulnerable ages and populations are overly exposed. God, <laughs> you can't even think about that. You're like, now we have an election system that's supported by the elderly during a pandemic. Like the actual implementation of the elections is now vulnerable from like as the standpoint of can we even vote? Can we even mail votes if they let us mail votes? And then like the polling stations that do exist are staffed by vulnerable people. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you for kind of like making me see just, just how, uh, how what, a, what, what we're dealing with actually. This is what we're dealing with, but you know what? This is why we're talking about this now. We're, mm -hmm. Again, we're six months out. That's not a long time, but it's enough time to get our shit together. Right. Uh, and it's it's gonna Gotta be, be on it's incumbent on each and each one of us as voters. Um, but really, what what I want to point to is that I not only want you to be a voter. If you're in the capacity, and if you have, if you are a, a person of health, um, this is a call to to service to all of those who can serve as poll workers. Um, so that means volunteering on the day of the election. Um, mm -hmm. Work that poll, y'all. Work that poll. Seriously. No, like. Literally, that's literally. <laughs> oh my god, that's the campaign. That's the new campaign. Exactly. Um, I'm I'm really excited um, to be leading some civic engagement work at Harvard University around voter engagement, um, and um, seeing that there's such a shortage in poll workers, and that there's this like amazing uh, group of individuals and students in college students, graduate students that want to, um, are waiting for a call to serve. This is their moment. This is all of our uh, moment and our call to serve. And so we'll be rolling out uh, an initiative to encourage these students um, to volunteer to serve as poll workers. And we hope to scale to other universities. Um, but again, this is not just strictly for students. Um, if you can do it, I really, um, encourage you to think about being um, a poll worker on election. I love the idea of just like all of these like very unexpected populations getting into those polls. Because I mean, honestly, like it shouldn't just be a bunch of old people who are staffing these in the first place, like people that look like you and me, people who are the populations that we want to get excited. It's like, I want a bunch of drag queens at these poll stations. Yeah. I want a bunch of young, young black and Latinx kids mm -hmm. at these poll stations, you know, I mean, I think that is something that is tangible because so many people think that there's like, oh, like, you know, I can't really do anything. I can at least vote. It's like, no, nah, get you and all your friends who spend all your time on Twitter and Instagram sharing memes about how fucked up everything is. Well, guess what? Y'all can work this poll. That is fantastic, Teresa. Yes. And so, um, oh, and then to boot, it pays. Hey, so and y'all ain't got no job. So <laughs> there's nothing stopping you. That's okay. Great. Yeah. So, so that's, that's something that has always been a, a, a constant issue of kind of the um, gap of age range that volunteer for, for this work. But I mean, it's legit, like, we need you. We, we, these, in order for us to be able to hold this, we need you to serve. Um, so yeah. I, I encourage you. I'm here. I'm about to work the polls my damn self. Seriously. Yes, you are. We, all, we both are. We are. <laughs> we'll share techniques. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's really exciting. And kind of like, since you mentioned Harvard, like I, I want to know if you have any, because obviously like Harvard has uh, a well-earned reputation as like an incredible university, but also kind of like most people do not feel like that's a place for them. I mean, same as Yale or anywhere else that we're talking about. What are some things that you've seen work to get things from this kind of idealized kind of academic theoretical place to like 
the people, you know, in Boston, in Roxbury, who like will never step on Harvard's campus, but are the people you actually need to hear this. No, absolutely. I mean, so there's a few ways. um, And that's something I'm really proud to have really focused on in my role um, of creating a a thought partnership with practitioners in the communities that are actually um, living our democracy day to day. Mm -hmm. And um, so I run a, a, a fellowship for practitioners that for one year, they basically incubate these ideas or reforms of which will basically make democracy more accessible. We also have, you know, we produce a lot of research and we try to get it to the hands of the people who are doing the work on the ground. And then again, it's creating or opening the platform of Harvard to to the voices and the people who are um, living in these cities. And, and, you know, we've been just very fortunate. Like we had a conference about a year and a half ago um, with about a hundred or so young-ish um democracy leaders and i'm talking about we flew people from um cuts of this country that like have never and would have never had an opportunity to be on the ground of harvard but we invited them because we think they have a lot to say and Mm -hmm. sometimes yes it's it's tempting to think that harvard has all the ideas but we can't have the ideas unless we're proximate and Mm -hmm. so um i mean really i think that we need to i want to change the way we think. We don't have all of the ideas, but we can ask a lot of questions and be exactly. in thought partnership. The community often has better ideas than y'all would have because they actually have more information about what's going on. 100%. 100%. Yep. Well, that's really useful. I mean, I think that like one of the things that bogs us down around now is just we're getting a fuller and fuller picture of just how much work there is to be done. And that feels really heavy and and really kind of like, uh intimidating and kind of potentially negative are there some things that are kind of bright spots or things that we're doing well or things that could kind of uh give us a little bit of a boost in momentum in terms of how we can turn the tide oh absolutely um you know it's hard to be talking about about election it is it's kind of a it's a it's a heavy topic right now um in that like i just laid out these are all of the fucked up ways um that um, the election can go wrong. And I'm not talking about what the outcome of the election is just like, literally, can you even vote? Um, But there's a lot of encouraging work um, that has been happening and um, before the pandemic and has taken new um, shapes and forms. So for example, I'm really encouraged um, how organizers who were trying to get citizens involved in our democracy have pivoted into serving um, mutual aid. Um, right. So like, shout out to organizations like Black Voters Matter and other mm-hmm. orgs that are providing like actual grants to people and to organizations to keep people afloat. I mean, right. you know, I don't think that like the organizers thought of themselves as like these like frontline providers, um, but their work has taken new meaning. And it's been amazing to see how organizations have pivoted to to help people out that's absolutely i mean well when the world when the priorities of the world change you gotta shift with them and if you don't so i mean like yes i would like to reiterate i've seen so many examples of people kind of using their infrastructure to meet the needs that even our government the people who are supposed to be doing what this is um is not doing so yeah they deserve an incredible amount of credit for being so dynamic and committed and effective most of all And again, this goes back to our earlier point of like, who's mo- most proximate to the people I need? It's, it's not these like big institutions. It's like your organizers that know everyone who lives on their block, mm-hmm. you know? And so um, that's what we're seeing just in a tremendous and effective way to connect with people and help people out during this time. I also want to raise up, um, again, this is prior to the pandemic, but definitely what we're seeing now is all of the um, youth that are, that are leading movements. Um, for example, um, shout out to 99 Roots in the Central Valley of California, who've been doing tremendous civic engagement work. Um, and, you know, and now I'm sure like a lot of students, they're like, you know, so they're like, 
they want to see greater civic engagement and then understandably they're dealing with a pandemic and they're learning from home and there's all these changes so i just want to like shed some light on how these organizations and youth leaders are still um they're so resilient and they're pressing forward and i think that that's a huge source of, of inspiration and um i also just want to give a shout out to all the people who are running for office at every level of government uh yes i mean that's um so i want to give another shout out to an organization called um run for something and they focus on supporting folks on down, down ballot campaigns and you know their theory is there are thousands of elected positions and a lot of them go uncontested so like mm -hmm. so, so you know most people have probably been there forever and you you want to talk about where people can be effective i mean you know part of my ask is like run for congress run for the state legislature we need you in those places but if those are are steps too far perhaps think about um serving on a commission in an appointed um fashion for example um election commissions those those are set at the county um state level for most states um if you have concern of like what the hell is happening at this moment think about getting yourself an appointment to that um think about all the different ways that you could be serving us and 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 this is also to say that like i'm seeing people answer that call to service in really inspiring ways and so I mean, those are kind of the bright, the bright spots in our democracy right now. And we need new blood in them. I mean, the reason that they've been not changing is because they've not, like the composition of them is so slow to change. Like imagine having like, even just a 10% like change or increase in like 30 or below, 30 years old or younger participation on commissions, on councils, on the types of people who even go to these. I mean, I have been to commission hearings. I have, I know you have. I mean, this is some shit that like, you want to talk about resilience. Sitting in the meetings is an exercise of resilience, I swear. <laughs> but it might actually not be that if there were different people there also, you know? So I think that kind of this reimagining that we're um, involved with now, it's not just kind of like imagining better outcomes because like we do more, it's like, the process will change with new people in the process, you know? And so I, that to me is worth fighting for. Oh, 100%. Um, and there's also other organizations that are, you know, really reimagining our democracy. So for example, you have the um, New American Leaders that um, train and support uh, new Americans. So these are people who are naturalized Americans, first generation, second generation. So um, individuals with a, with a legacy of, of, of being immigrants um, mm -hmm. or of an immigrant background um, to run for office and to win. And they're doing amazing work um, across the country because like you said, I mean, the, to, to bring new voices into decision-making power does affect not only the outcomes, but the process itself. And I right. like to think that in a good democracy, you need both. You need both. And the thing is, these problems that are popping up this year, some of them, like you said earlier, are legacy problems. These are problems that have kind of been, uh, we've been trying to combat since the dawn of this country. Others are things that are new, you know, like the internet or like pandemics or the million other things that we're going to have. And so some of them are new problems, but we also have new solutions and tools to affect them. Like I'm already thinking of like, how can we get TikTok? to do a poll worker campaign. Like yes. a I'm just saying like, you're gonna do all this, like, you know, all these challenges <laughs> and like whatever's, you know, like do that around poll. I mean, like this is, we do have tools that I think are more engaging to use and like are more widespread and diverse in their reach and impact. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know what, it's gonna take everything. It's gonna yep. take all the platforms, it's gonna take, um, I just, I also feel like we're like in the middle of like kind of democracy renaissance um, so we know that there's problems and there's fissures in our democracy. And then there's like a lot of cool people that I meet that are trying to solve these problems. Technology, you know, has a place, um, but also just like these bright minds. And it's just, again, very encouraging to see younger, younger people answering that call. Um, but you know what, in reflection, I don't know if I want to do a TikTok video on the poll work. I mean, like, do we, do we, do it, does that mean that I have to like learn how to dance? 
I mean, I, it, it would be more wordplay than poll play, if you know what I mean. Ah! If I can say that on YouTube, <laughs> which I can. Um, but I think that I'm just saying that like all the creativity and kind of humor that is being harnessed to kind of actually do real shit. That's what I'm talking about. It's like, I would love to have a contest. that's like, y'all make me the best video, the most viral video for getting people to register to become poll workers. And like TikTok's going to give you $25,000, you know, I mean, or Harvard is hear that Harvard. Um, but I mean, like, that's the kind of stuff that I'm like, because people just consider this stuff so dry and not fun and serious and like only serious nerdy wonky people even care about it or or they'll like you know you get into a meeting and you look like a young kid from whatever neighborhood who's in there to be interested and people treat you like shit so it's like we got to be more people like us on the dais to kind of welcome these new people because who's to say there won't be a lot of hostility for new involvement i mean there's a reason that those people are not invited and don't feel welcome right as well mm -hmm. so i think being really serious about the conditions of you know we didn't spend too much time talking about kind of the the cultural barriers and kind of like the actual you know kind of efforts in place to make people feel like they're it, this is not their place mm -hmm. and i think that one of your best messages is like this is your place this is your shit mm -hmm. like we are americans and we need to understand that it's our duty and our right to affect what the fuck is going on here Yep, 100%. 100%. No, and it's, you know, I, I just wish that, um, I think that the sustainability of our democracy is people's ability to feel part of it. Because they are part of it, whether they, they know it or not. And if it means like, we're making some TikTok videos, um, if it means we're going to live stream or we're going to have, um, you know, people that we really admire and respect getting that message out, I mean, it's worth doing. It's all worth doing because everyone, everyone is critical to, to what the future of this democracy will look like. Absolutely. I mean, because it impacts you whether you like it or not. You know, you vote or not, you still are abiding by whatever goes down in this country. So you might as well. I mean, that's what this whole thing is about. It's like, I didn't know, you know, what my role in is in a pandemic. You know, when we have our election infrastructure crumbling around us, I mean, that's your job, right? But like, you know, even I'm like, let me condition his hair and get a ring light and figure out like how I can get someone like Teresa to kind of say what the fuck's going on in a way that is like highly informed, intelligent and accessible. So thank you so much, Teresa. That was really, really awesome. I hope that you um, are encouraged by what you see in the next few months. I mean, I think so too. And, and you know, and before we go, um, I just want to just remind folks of what I've asked them to do. Um, so this is my, my four asks over the next um, six months. Um, and this is what we long do till election day, okay? You tell um, them. One, you're gonna make a plan to vote in advance. You're gonna register, request your absentee ballot. Um, again, you can visit vote411.org for all of your voting resources. Um, look out for educa uh, education on the voting modes that you can take part of. Follow your state's um, Secretary of State for updates on Twitter. Um, a lot of Secretary of States are really great at that. Um, also, buy a book of stamps. Um, right, 51 cents each, might get a discount for a group. Exactly, Probably not. Exactly. A book of stamps uh, will cost you like, I don't know, like 18 bucks. You get them at the grocery store, if not, of course, the post office. Um, keep those on hand. And then again, just make sure that you're sharing them with your fam and your friends letting everyone know what their rights, but also what their responsibilities are um, leading up to the election. Um, and if, if you're gonna vote in person, it also explore ways if your state allows for early voting and how you can get on that. Um, the second thing I wanna remind folks to do, again, if you are able to, um, I'm asking that you answer a call for our democracy and volunteer to be a poll worker. Um, and then send us or tag us on these TikTok videos. Please, um, me especially. Please, you especially, Trey. <laughs> I gotta get on TikTok, but I will for that. Same. Okay, you mark I'll my word. Same. Yeah, yeah, hold me wait. accountable. <laughs> One hundred. Um, and and so and you know you don't have to wait till November. There's still some primaries that are happening in in certain states. For example, um, in Massachusetts, we have our congressional primaries happening in. September, early fall.
So we have to already be worried about how we're going to get poll workers, um, st our poll stations staffed up with poll workers. And I encourage you to check out Harvard Votes Challenge in the coming weeks for more information. And that's voteschallenge.harvard.edu or contact your local election office um, by Googling or ask uh, Alexa um, to connect you. But we need you. Um, Again, you're gonna remind your friends and family to fill out the decennial census um, and you can visit, right. or they can visit, uh, 2020census.gov. It's really, really critical that we're each counted. And then finally, we're gonna have to raise hell with our senators, um, members of Congress um, to pass needed funding um, to make sure that states can um, afford all the innovations that need to happen very, very quickly to make sure that we each um, have accessibility to a ballot um, via mail if needed. Um, and we need to save the US Postal um, Service. So again, pressure all um, that- that It's not a game. Power. It's not a game. It's just not a game. Um, we have six months to get it done, but I trust all of us in, in being able to, to really able to uh, make change. I love it. See, Harvard comes prepared. She was like, Y'all were listening, right? In case you weren't, here's the, here's the bare bones. So <laughs> awesome. Those are all incredibly tangible, effective, and kind of like visible things that people can be doing and, and trackable. You know, we'll be able to see if people are doing this, you know, come November or come December, you know, not just with the results, but with the, like the levels of engagement. And I really would love for an outcome of all of this, you know, justifiable hysteria and kind of anxiety to you know, an outcome be people taking it more seriously and kind of putting themselves in the driver's seat for their own lives and the lives of this country. So you are brilliant and awesome. It's always a joy to see your face. I just like, I can't believe what's going on, but things like this do make me feel more connected to a bright future and to my people and you are my people. So love you, sweetheart. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, and keep doing you. awesome work out there. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you so much for um, inviting me and thanks for um, everyone that is tuning in and in advance. Thank you for everyone that's been about to kill it in these elections. And, you know, again, um, take up the call to actions and make some change happen. For sure. We can do it. Um, all right, Barrett. Well, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks, Trey. Bye. Bye. Wow. So that, I mean, Teresa, thank you so much again. That was wonderful. Um, like I said, she made it really easy for y'all. Uh, she made it easy for me because honestly, all I really got to do is uh, tell you what she said uh, and put my spin on it. So I think that, you know, in terms of what we going to do, uh, follow what she said. Literally, make a plan to vote. Don't just, you know, have it be a couple days before this election and then be like, how are we voting? Like, where's my drop? Like, where's my mail-in ballot? Like, where's all that stuff? You know, or let alone that happening with your crew of friends. Make sure you have your shit together and make sure everyone around you has their shit together because this is something that really needs to be executed and there's going to be all types of unforeseen circumstances. So do that. Um, I am really serious about this poll worker campaign. I mean, if I could find a poll, I would be dancing while giving my recommendations because I really think that, that is something so brilliant and could really transform most people's experience of voting overnight if we really got involved. So I will be following up with something you know, I've already got my wheels turning about that, but sign up to be a poll worker if you're physically able. Um, and then, you know, also, Maybe sign up to be a census taker. I mean, I'm not sure when that is over, but I think that like, don't forget that this is not just about voting. It is about so many different ways to engage with your civic duty. And uh, a really major one, which only comes around every 10 years, even more rare than a presidential election, is the census. So please make sure you're filling that out and the people in your community and your family are filling that out too. And like she said, Raise hell. This is not the time to be quiet. This is not the time to say, let someone else do it. Or it's not that big a deal. Or I don't want to get involved. It's too ugly or it's whatever. Whatever your excuse is. That excuse does not uh, have any place right now. You get out there. You do what you got to do. You see some bullshit. You tell them. Anyone who needs to know. See, Vescal Diago. I used to see that on the uh, New York subway every day. It's like, you see something, say something. It's like, that applies not just to misinformation and 
fuckery at the polls. It's talking about everything at this point that you see that's wrong, that falls short of what we expect from our democracy. Um, and I'll add just a couple things of my own, like, do not give up. It is so easy to see the, the chaos and the fissures in our system and the apathy and the suffering and just say, it's too much. Like, you know, it is too much for us to turn the tide, but that is not true. In fact, this could be the very time where enough of us say, you know, I have had it. I usually would not get involved, but like it is starting to affect all of us to such an extreme extent that we got to band together. And that moment, like she said, like it is a powerful moment when we come together and say, we're not going to fucking take this shit. And we win. And I think that that is what you have to hold on to, even when it's looking extremely bleak like it is now. Um, goes without saying, vote. Like, <laughs> you can't be like, I am a participant in our democracy and I want to have control about, you know, something that's going to happen to me when you don't even do the measly and kind of like important, but pretty straightforward and simple gesture of just actually getting your vote counted. So please, at the very least, um, do that. And lastly, I think we have to just reimagine this whole country in terms of who is in charge. Like, as she was going through all the different kind of ways that people can get civically engaged, whether it's running as a candidate or being on a commission or volunteering at a poll station or working at a poll station or voting or census takers, we give the we give the overwhelming uh, share of these roles to people who are privileged, people who are white, people who are old, people without nose rings, people who are, you know, people who ain't gay, people who ain't, you know, out here being who they are and being someone who's feeling on the margins. Like, I think that we need to take this country back. You know, I mean, I guess we can't say back. We got to take this country now. I think that one thing that we can really get involved with is that, well, that we can all get behind is this place could look more like us. I could show up to a poll and see a bunch of queer kids of color saying like, here's your stuff, Manana, here's your stuff, Dia. Like you could have a wonderful community-based experience if more people got involved. You could go to a city council meeting and they'd be surrounded by people that you know and then look up there and see people that you know. I mean, going into these environments, we have to convince people who are much older, much more privileged, much more white, much less invested in radical change and expect them to do what we want. Like, that's not how it works. We have to be in there making these differences and making these changes ourselves. So I would encourage you to kind of just think really hard of like what that world would look like and feel like and let that animate how you get involved. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow when we have our recap episode and we'll introduce the topic and the guests for next week. This is Trey Borden, your host. Thank you so much. Have a great day.